Hello everybody and welcome to my YouTube channel where I film and post videos about pretty much anything that interests me that could be commentary or react video, true crime case, or just beauty products. It's literally kind of random as of now. Today we're going to be talking about a true crime case. It's actually a missing persons case and it's going to be a lot shorter than some of my past true crime videos. I do want to give a few trigger warnings. This case involves a child, obviously murder, CA, and I believe that's it. This case also is not as gruesome as the others. There's not a whole lot of gruesome detail. Let's get started. On a cold February of 1957, a young man embarked into a wooded area area northeast of Philadelphia. He went into the woods to check some muskrat traps that he had previously set out. As he was checking these traps, he stumbled upon a box. He kind of felt that the box was heavier and he figured that there was some sort of animal in it. This was whenever he looked into the box and saw that there was a human being. He was horrified to see the deceased body of a young boy inside this box. This man actually did not report this to the police because he was afraid that his traps would get confiscated if he did report it to the police. That should not be your first thought at all, but whatever. A few days later on the 25th, a college student who actually knew about the traps that were in this area, I don't know if he was friends with the previous guy or what, but he knew about the traps. He was passing by and he saw a little bunny rabbit hop into a bush where he knew one of the traps was at. He decided to pull over on the side of the road and just check it out, see if it caught the bunny or what. This is whenever this man discovered the body of the young boy. This college kid was also reluctant to tell the police. I'm not sure if he was just afraid of the police or if he was like trying to think about his friend's traps. Regardless, he ended up telling the police the next day after he told a minister about it and a minister told him, you need to tell the police. Whenever investigators showed up to the crime scene the next day on the 26th, they discovered that it was a young boy between the ages of four and six. He was said to look like a doll. Cold weather slows down decomposition, so it pretty much looked very similar to how he would have looked whenever he was first killed. He was completely unclothed and wrapped in a flannel blanket. He was stuffed inside a bassinet box from JCPenney's, and it was obvious that the boy had been malnourished and also beaten. He had bruises all over his body. Another strange factor about this case is the boy's haircut. It seemed like the boy had recently and very quickly gotten a haircut, probably after he was dead, but it was a very fast and uneven haircut. There was parts of the hair that still clung to his body. It just definitely was not like an intentional haircut looking thing. Early in the case, the police were actually very confident that they were gonna be able to find and identify the dead body. Until they could identify the boy, this case slash boy went by the name of the boy in the box. They took the boy's fingerprints. However, nothing really came of this. I guess there wasn't his fingerprints in the database or anything, so this kind of was a dead end. However, this case did receive a good bit of media attention in the Philadelphia slash Delaware Valley area. 400 thousand flyers were printed out and plastered pretty much everywhere. At every storefront, there was a flyer of this boy, pictures of this boy. They actually put the flyer in every single gas bill that was sent out in the Philadelphia area. A few days later, 270 officers went back to the crime scene basically to comb over the entire scene to see if they could find any other evidence. And this was actually somewhat successful in the sense that they did find other pieces of evidence. The police found a blue corduroy hat that belonged to a man. It definitely wasn't a child's hat. It was a man's hat. A child's scarf and a man's white handkerchief with the letter G in the top right corner. The cap was traced to a local hat store and the police went to the hat store to talk to the owner of it. The owner says that she remembers a man coming in to purchase that hat. He was alone, but they never could find this man. Going back to the box that the dead boy's body was in, they actually found the person who purchased this box. There was absolutely no link between the person and this case at all. Complete dead ends everywhere. This case pretty much ran completely cold fairly quickly, and this is whenever the theories started to emerge, as they do. 
Some of the more like outlandish theories were that he was a Hungarian refugee that had come to the United States because of the revolution that was happening in that country. Another theory was that he was the son of some local carnival workers that had children that died under some mysterious circumstances. But none of these theories really had any substance to them. Some of the more popular and believed theories at the time had to do with a foster home that was located about a mile and a half away from this crime scene. Remington Bristow, a person who had worked at the medical examinator's office who basically made this entire investigation his personal mission. He wanted to see that the boy was identified and that there was justice served to this case before he died. He actually went to a psychic to help figure out some information on this case. The psychic described a house to Bristow. Bristow got the psychic, brought her to the crime scene, and she led him directly to a foster house that was the exact way that she described it. Now, this foster house definitely had some very sketchy sh going on. It was not a normal situation. Essentially, the foster father had been in relations with the stepdaughter. Bristow believed that the foster father had gotten his stepdaughter pregnant and that together they disposed of the body so that she wouldn't be exposed as an unwed mother. Which is crazy that that would be the focus, the unwed mother part and not the incestuous relationship. But this theory fell flat whenever investigators figured out that the couple had been married during the time that this dead body would have been born. So this theory was closed. Another theory was brought forward actually in 2022, which is like 65 years after this body was found. And it was brought forward by this lady who goes by the name M or Martha. I'm just gonna call her Martha. Martha had accused her mother of buying a child from its birth parents and then proceeding to beat the child and discard of it a little bit outside of the Philadelphia area in a box. She said that this happened in summer of 1954, which lines up. The police saw her theory as plausible, but they were a little bit weary of Martha because she had a very, very long history of mental illness. I'm not exactly sure what mental illness she struggled with, but it was documented. The police knew about it. And on top of that, she had no actual proof of this at all. In fact, several neighbors were tracked down and interviewed and every single one of them said that her claims were absolutely ridiculous and they had never seen a boy the entire time that they were neighbors. This case stayed cold for 65 years straight. During that time, the boy's body had been buried twice. The second time included an installation of a large headstone that read, America's unknown child, with a plaque under it that read, Heavenly Father, bless this unknown boy. On November 30th of 2022, Philadelphia Police Department announced that they had actually identified the boy in the box using genetic testing and investigative genetic genealogy. The boy who had been unknown for 65 years finally had a name. This boy was four years old, Joseph Augustus Zarelli. His second cousin had uploaded their DNA profile to a public database. Once there was a connection here made, they went to the second cousin's mother, which would have been Joseph's first cousin, and had her submit her genetic profile, which was a match and proved that Joseph was a part of this family, which proved that this dead boy was Joseph. This genetic testing obviously allowed the police to identify the parents, which is a very important part of this case. This was definitely a high profile case, so chances are the parents knew about this, or at least one of them did. Regardless, let's discuss the parents. His father was named Augustus John Zarelli, and his mother was Mary Elizabeth Plunkett. She went by Betsy, though. Augustus was a son of Italian immigrants, and his family was very active in the local community and church. One of Augustus' old neighbors actually recalls that he was just a very good person all around. His mother, Betsy, had recently graduated high school whenever she decided that she was gonna live with her parents for the time being. In the early 
series, Betsy actually gave birth to a baby girl. The father of this baby girl is unknown, but she gave this baby up for adoption. I'm assuming she just wasn't in the place to raise this child, so she did what she had to do and gave the baby up for adoption. Betsy started working at the old Goldman Theater in Central City. It's unclear when, where, and how Betsy met Augustus and had a child with him. Well, it's not unclear how she had a child with him, but it's unclear where their paths crossed. But she gave birth to their son Joseph on January 13th, 1953. Both names were actually on the birth certificate and both parents were genetically the biological parents. It's also unclear who Joseph lived with. There's no information right now on the split of Augustus and Betsy. We actually don't even know if Augustus knew he had a son with Betsy. Sometime after Joseph's birth, Betsy married a man named John Plunkett, which was actually the manager of that Goldman Theater that she was working at. On December of 1956, Betsy gave birth to their oldest daughter, and two months after this birth, Joseph's body was found. Joseph's parents were never married, and they went on to have completely separate families of their own. Betsy died in 1991, and Augustus died in 2014. There's still an ongoing police investigation to figure out what exactly happened, who killed this boy, what was the reasoning behind it. I personally think it's a a little sketchy that Betsy got with this new man and two months after their child was born, Joseph shows up dead. I mean, Betsy definitely had to know that that was her son, right? I mean, unless she gave up that son through some sort of adoption that was not documented or something, Betsy would have known that that was her son. First off, I don't understand why she didn't report her son missing. Secondly, whenever she saw pictures of her missing dead son, why didn't she call the police or show any sort of like concern all the way until she literally died. It's very odd, Betsy was reported to be a very, very nice, amazing person, which definitely doesn't clear someone of murder. There's a lot of people out there that are nice and still do horrendous things. This is complete speculation of my own. Maybe her husband did something and she just didn't want her husband to get in trouble. So she just kind of covered it up, ignored it. Regardless, this child didn't just end up in this box, like something Thing obviously definitely happened. There was absolutely some sort of intention behind this. This child was literally beat to death. It even could have been Augustus. We don't know where Joseph lived when he was alive. Both sides of the family, the current step-siblings of Joseph are still processing their link in this case. It was a huge shock to them that this huge Philadelphia case had been associated with their parents, their cousin, their sibling. They're taking some time to fully digest this before they start sharing their stories, but they absolutely do plan on sharing their stories and helping investigators get to the bottom of this. Unfortunately, the family has gotten all sort of hate threats and harassment on social media. I just wanna make sure that anybody who's watching this video, please don't harass the family. It is not the family's fault. On January 13th of 2023, which would have been Joseph's 70th birthday, a new memorial containing his full name and image was unveiled, along with the addition of his name in the existing headstone, which is honestly a beautiful way to show respect to this little boy who had his life taken away from him way, way too soon. There was also several family members that showed up to this memorial to pay their respects. So yeah, that's about all we have on this case. These are all very, very new recent developments and I'll definitely do my best to keep this channel updated. I may come back to this video and do a recap. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment, do whatever you can to get more interaction. I'm trying to rebuild my channel up from what it used to be. I am not in the freaking algorithm. Please help me get there. I really enjoy making videos. Thank you for watching. Stay safe.